welcome to the World Wild Podcast. I'm Miles Irving, and this is the first episode we've put out for a few weeks um, for various reasons. Partly, I've been really busy, and also we've had a couple of um, slip-ups with um, scheduling, just people, us missing people, and, and uh, difficulty getting dates in place and so on. But um, anyway, it's been interesting to see that we appear to still be picking up lots of new listeners um, as we look at the stats um, for the podcast, a lot, a lot of a lot of new people are listening to some of the episodes from previous months, so that's great. So this week, I'm going to welcome uh, Anu Tosavainen from, uh, who's a friend of mine from Lapland. She works at the um, Lapland Education Centre Redu, which is uh, up in Lapland. Uh, I'll say more about that in a minute. And just for now, I had a I had an email from one of the listeners suggesting that um, I should do a regular thing of just what's what's good at this particular time and obviously that's not going to be relevant to everybody listening um but we do have a predominantly european and north american audience at the moment um it'd be interesting to see how that will change over the years but at any rate um hopefully uh, if if this is a there's a little brief slot um it'll it'll be helpful for immediately helpful and practical to um those who have the plants that I mentioned growing in that area and everybody else can just find it interesting. I mean, I, I I'd find it quite interesting to hear what's in season in um, the Northern Territory in Australia right now or South Africa right now, if I was listening. But um, there we are. So what we have just now, it's um, very good for smooth sow thistle. There's quite a lot of that coming through, um, just young plants. And um, we've, we've had a particularly good harvest of chickweed um i was i was quite sort of sad that the cattle had been allowed on the organic field next to my house to uh, graze off all of the salads that i've been just delighting in for the last few weeks it's been a case of just being able to go out and pick you know between um eight and twelve different wild plants and just put them in a salad or cook them up as greens every day, um, including chickweed. And the cattle have just eaten that right off now, which is which is um, meaning I'm having to go further afield for my salads. But the interesting thing is, yeah, we've eaten, we've also this week for the first time eaten some of the, the beef from um, a previous herd that have been on the land nearby us. There's a sort of rotation of organic fields that Leo the farmer uh, puts them on. Um, and that's been very... Um, well, with all the stuff we've been talking to uh, Fred Provenza about, and just thinking about the diet of animals um, for the for themselves and our diet for ourselves, but obviously when you eat the meat of an animal, you're eating um, in a secondary way the um, the diet of the animal turned into transformed into meat. So um, I'm super conscious of what I'm eating when I tuck into that beef. You know, we had it on Sunday as a roast, and then. We've been eating it in sandwiches since. And just that real consciousness that I'm eating food from here, it's its kind of gone to another level since I've been eating the same plants um, from the same place. But anyway, we've had to move further afield for chickweed, um, but we just called around some local farmers that we work with and we were directed to a, um, a field that's growing beet and various other plants. So they're this sort of market market gardening type setup, absolutely covered in chickweed. So that's that's great. At the moment, we've got some good sour thistle from there too. Uh, the rose hips are still on the bushes, and um, I've mentioned before that I, I have a rather extreme approach to rose hips, which I do chew them and eat them whole, but I also chop them in half and scrape the seeds out, and then you can chop the main part of the fruit, the red part, so long as they're still firm. Now, if they're not firm, what you need to do with a rose hip is just gently squeeze it between your three biggest fingers and your thumb, and you can you can just get this pulp that comes out enables you to just eat it there and then. Um, it's like instant jam. But uh, if not, then, um, like, if, if, if you want, alternatively, I should say, rather than if not, uh, you can push that through a sieve. It's quite laborious, but then you get this kind of jammy puree that can be used uh, in all sorts of ways, sweet and savory. And then just the very last of the hawthorn berries are still on the, on the bushes somewhere. Although we've had rather... In some places, we've had rather a poor season for hawthorn berries. And three-corner garlic is coming through now. That's one of the wild alliums, which has naturalized from people's gardens. It's a bit like a Chinese chai, but you can just chop those and use them pretty much anything. And there are still some some nettles about, so you can you can harvest nettles 
And um, it's worth going on the Forager website and searching our recipes there because we've got some nice recipes such as a very simple nettle soup, uh, nettles and eggs, and, and a sort of crispy seaweed type recipe with just, you know, nettles fried till they're crispy with a little bit of chili, uh, lemon juice and salt. Okay, so I'll, I'll get on to um, just giving you a little bit of background on uh, Anu and how I know Anu. So Anu's place of work is amazing. They, they basically teach people to set up or they enable people, equip people and mentor people to set up businesses based around wild plants and mushrooms. Um, and, and, and I should say, for example, in, in Finland, they have a licensing scheme where if you're going to sell mushrooms to a restaurant, you need to go and do a course. And Anu is one of the places you can go to do this. Anu's place is one of the places you can go to do this course. And you learn two mushrooms at a time. Then you get a, a license that shows that you've gone through uh, some training to properly identify these mushrooms. And then when you go to a restaurant to with those two species of mushrooms, they'll ask to look at your license. And until you've done um, a license for other species, you can't sell those. So I think it's it's, it's a pretty good system because, uh, yeah, I do, I do have concerns that at the moment pretty much anybody can turn up at the door of a restaurant um, with no with no qualifications, um, and I think this is a this is a good system. So Anu's Anu's part of that, but she also works with people with just pretty much any kind of idea that they want to uh, develop around working with wild plants um, or mushrooms. Um, and you'll hear more about that in in the um, in the conversation that follows. Um, I got to know Anu through a friend of mine, very good friend of mine called Sammy Tolberg, who is um a chef that does a lot of foraging i first met him when he was working for the riverton grill um as part of that was mark hicks's team at the time and yeah we got to know each other i went to visit him in finland we went out foraging together and, and um he's written well i've only got one of them but i think at least two books in in the finnish language and now he pretty much specializes in doing foraging events foraging and cooking events there um and we were popping over to finland one summer and, and he put me in touch with anu who had me take some of the students out there and we went for a long walk in the forest with the kids. Um, we had both our kids there, Ali, um, my wife and I, and, and the, the uh, two children, Ella and Kit, went for a very long walk through this forest, but there were sort of stations along the way where Anu's students were doing um, a practical part of what they have to do to, to uh, get their qualification. And some of them, their business idea was around doing uh, aromatics in warm water as foot baths. So, so like soothing, but also beneficial to the skin and in other ways. Um, and so we had the, the real treat of arriving at certain parts of the wood and being able to sit down and have this, this warm foot bath with all the plants to, uh, to soothe and comfort our aching feet. And I think, I think students passed with flying colors for, for what they were able to do with, with the knowledge of the plants and, and just, how to make a nice foot bath. Okay, so then there's one last thing I need to say just before we get on to the conversation with Anu, and that is uh, to tell you about something that's part of Finnish culture, which we've we've learned and gradually become a little bit more accustomed to and, and, and familiar with and comfortable with, and that is the, the role uh, or the incidence of silence in conversations with with Finnish people. Uh, we did read about it in the guidebook as we were going over for the first time to Finland. We read one of these travel guides and it said, uh, you know, the Finns are very comfortable with silence and, and uh, don't, don't let it unnerve you. If, um, if, you know, the conversation seems to have ground to a halt, it hasn't. It's just that Finns are comfortable with, with silence and, 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 and they will, um, if you can just, hang on they will uh, resume the conversation in a minute it just means they're they're comfortable with you and they're comfortable with the conversation and probably they're thinking about what they're going to say next or thinking thinking about what you just said and that really came home to us i mean in, in our experience but talking to finnish people we we uh we spent one we one day were on the turku archipelago staying in a hut on an island and we had to go to the the sort of mainland and and meet with our host and I think we had to actually charge our mobile phones or something like that. Um, but we we had this conversation, and and really there was there was about something like a three minute silence. Um, fairly soon after we'd arrived, and and there'd been some initial chit chat, and then we were all just looking out at the islands, looking out across the water, and really nothing was said for about three minutes. And we we were just kind of 
well, we were, I mean, we were fit to burst, but we just, we thought we're just going to hang on. We're going to do like the book said. And then um, after about three minutes, he said, so, and opened up a whole area of conversation. And it turned out to be an absolute humdinger what he opened up. He, he, he had been a plant enthusiast when he was a child and he had thought up the most interesting thing he could say to us, knowing we were interested in plants, told us all about a plant that we, we could go and visit if we wanted that was very rare that he'd discovered in the forest when he was a child. And, and there we were. So it does make you wonder when, when we're all so busy to blurt out something and fill the silence, whether we, we miss out on perhaps on what, what could be said. And we, we later on, we saw some finished television in which people were having a discussion about, um, I'm not even sure if there were subtitles and whether we could follow it. I, but I, I gather we couldn't actually, thinking about it. The point of the story is that there was a lot of silence on this TV program. There's four or five people sitting around discussing and um, somebody would end what they had to say and everybody else would just sit there and go, hmm. And the silence just went on for, well, I didn't time it, but I think at least 30 seconds, that kind of, that kind of time. So anyway, I'm saying that because this conversation with Anu is um, in that sense, a typical conversation with a Finnish person. So there are some pauses, there are some silences. And I just want to say, you do not need to adjust your set. There's nothing wrong with your uh, equipment. There's nothing wrong with your broadband connection. Um, these silences actually did happen. Um, I think I think Joel shared with me that there was there was uh, another even longer silence which he has edited out because he thought you probably would all just think the uh, something was broken. Um, but anyway, that's that's uh, that's a that's a, a advance warning and um, be interesting to see how that comes across in your listening experience. So okay, we'll um, we'll now proceed to the conversation. So how was it to take that time out and come back? Did you did you come back refreshed and? Actually, I realized when I, I take my started my studies that uh, it was quite good to have a little bit rest from work because when you are doing things, yes by yes, and uh, somehow you just locked up the certain way to think or doing that work. And when I started my studies, I realized that uh, it's it's going to be a good thing that I'm I'm off the teaching job. And when I came back in January, I I noticed that my thoughts has changed quite a lot. And uh, yeah, I, I can say that I was refreshed also. But. Uh, thinking about a little bit different angle. Do you think that because you'd immersed yourself in more of the sort of artist's space that, that you brought you brought that back in, or was it just the fact that you'd had time out? Um, actually, many of my relatives and friends ask uh, me when I started my studies that, okay, you are changing, you are doing different things, but uh, actually it wasn't so different. I, I could use my knowledge of wild food or wild things to do some art art and um, and the basic thing my studies was that we were studying and researching that how we can make some more information to our senses from nature and how it is going to affect your picture of nature, no matter is it in your head or in your camera, that picture. Wow, that's really interesting. I seem to be hearing this from all directions at the moment, but emphasis on just paying attention to what, what our senses are receiving. It's a topic that keeps coming up at the moment. The concrete way, uh, which I realized um, during my studies that uh, before my studies, uh, my teaching was like, um, okay, I know the ingredients coming from nature and how to recognize them and what kind of products you can do it and how you can teach them to other people or students. Mm. But after 
after my studies, I realized that it's it's more, it's much more wider thing. It's not just the knowledge or information, but it's the, I think it's the sense of nature, which is the quite important thing which I'm teaching to people. Yeah, so where does that go beyond information? I mean, to, you know, if you impart information, you just have to, you're kind of expounding facts or describing a process or something. If I'm teaching uh, to students that um, this plant is growing this kind of place, this it feels like this, it tastes like this, you can do it, this kind of products of it. Mm. But uh, after this, I realized that, well, it's like moving the information from me to the student. But uh, instead of that moving, there's going to be um, personal uh, experience of the student uh, when she or he takes when she's learning the plant, tasting it or smelling it, and then realized with what kind of place it's growing. And it that mm, sense of nature or information of nature, it's it's pushing the student more into the nature than just just the information of what kind of, or technical information, what kind of plant it, yeah. plant it is. I know exactly what you mean. It's, it's, it, it's basically, you're realizing that you're doing a different job to the one that you thought you were doing. Yeah. Exactly. Instead yes. of taking these things out of your head, yeah. putting them in their head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. yeah. And uh, one of my students said that, if she could have all the power in world, everybody should go this school. To your head. Yes, yeah. yeah. Because of, she doesn't mean that what I figured out, but uh, at the same words, but uh, thinking of it, it was the same way because she was quite um educated about nature and she was so amazed that uh, this was totally different than she thought it might be and she figured out that it's important to uh, educate or this kind of school that you can read the nature you can be part of the nature you realized how important the nature is to human being I mean, I think, just thinking of a way of putting it in very few words, it's just that you've, you've, um, the contrast is that that person had already acquired a lot of information. Mm. So that wasn't the job that you needed to do for her. But by coming to your school, she acquired some relation. Yeah. And that's quite a different, yeah, it's a very different job. Mm. But still, we have the same basic things we have to teach here. But my my point or my thoughts are a little bit different. It's the I think it's the holistic thing which I think about that where I can put my knowledge of uh, wild things. Yeah, I mean, I I think more and more that what we're doing is what you know when we get out and harvest things and process them and the fact is it becomes a, a, a rhythm and a routine rather than you know isolated incidents you, you're not just there's a one-off and to go out and gather a mm. plant or mushroom that's something that's going to happen again and again and again through the years and then you're not going to just bring it back and make a one-off tea or a one-off uh some other product that's going to happen again and again and 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 so you get um more and more and in, intricately involved and i more and more think of it as a 
as a dance that we're participating in. And um, that's a very different thing from a, like we're saying, from just um, acquiring a bunch of a bunch of facts. It's it's um, well, you know, you can just walk away. It's like you introduce people to a dance partner, and 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 then you once you've helped them to understand the first few steps of the dance, you can walk away because mm-hmm. they're going to ca- that's going to carry on. Um, so that's um, but it, it's funny. I guess it, I think there is a difference between doing something and not realizing you're doing it. Mm-hmm. And then doing it when you do realize you're doing it. So you, you're doing exactly the same thing as you were doing before, but with more of an understanding that it's relational and not um, not imparting the facts. I think that then you can you can do exactly the same thing, but just somehow it's it it can go a lot deeper when you when you um, yeah when you realize what it is you're actually doing. Mm-hmm. And I think that. Uh... Uh, that feeling or uh, say, uh, um, that feeling has been there already, but I wasn't aware of it until I realized that, okay, that's why. And our way to do the teaching by doing is is a good way because that makes the students to do the connections to the plants and that way to the nature. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny though, because I find I find one of the things that I'm spending a lot of time doing at the moment and when I give talks and so on is, is trying to uh, talk about the ideas of you know the interconnectedness of all things and um, that in order to participate in that we need to actually touch and make contact. Um, and you can use metaphors of like the face to face, um, that we have when we talk to one another, um, Mm. which is ironic because your camera's not working. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, ironic to mention that, but that's why I'm trying to do the Skype conversations with, with, with face to face and just, just trying to be aware of how powerful that is, you know, to talk to people face to face and be physically present. But you can use that as a metaphor for, for understanding what happens when we, relate to plants or the landscape and we have this face-to-face contact and we actually touch and participate because there's a kind of emerging and a mixing of of ourselves and the plants and the land and anyway what what i'm trying to say is i'm finding actually quite useful to use these um actually reflections whilst sitting in a room talking about it and maybe showing some pictures on a screen um because um, then that's a different kind of information. It, it, it's an information about the relation. And then what, what I'm hoping to achieve by that is that when people um, have these experiences, they, they, they kind of understand a bit more what's happening. Mm-hmm. And then that, that means that you can do it on purpose. You can sort of say, okay, what are the things that give me that direct contact, that sort of face-to-face, as it were, and what are the things that are actually uh, keeping me away from that? What are the things that fill up my time and attention so that I'm not having face-to-face or direct contact with, with anything? You know? So anyway, that's, I'm spending quite a bit of time developing those kind of thoughts so that um, hopefully uh, those are yeah, useful tools. I studied that uh, nature photography, and uh, one big question there was that is it allowed human being be in the photograph of nature? And um, traditional photographers, nature photographers, say that human being is not part of nature, so he or she couldn't be at the photograph when you are describing the nature. But uh, our research group, we think and we thought that uh, it's not the good way to think. And I I also think that uh, this is also like my teaching, that we have the all the 
techniques and uh, informations and everything there. But we have to remember that also we people, human beings, we are also part of nature. Mm. And also thinking about, the, you were talking about the connection with uh, Skype, with the <coughs> uh, video contacts, that uh, usually we think that nature photography is that is a picture of which camera makes, but also it's the picture of inside of people's head. Mm. We all, all have our kind of picture of nature. And uh, I think that uh, mixing these two things together, <laughs> my teaching and my art, is like um, you can be part of doing the big picture of somebody's head about the nature. It's like the when you are eating or uh, making some products of, for example, meadow sweet, you are also building a picture of nature inside your head, mm -hmm. touching and tasting and smelling of meadow sweet. It's interesting that you say touching and tasting and smelling, and also it's implied in what you're saying that you're seeing as well. So the only sense you didn't mention there was hearing. And 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 I guess you would even hear it a little bit when you when you rustle the the drive material. But um, I'm I'm reading a, slowly. I'm reading this very interesting book called um, The Spell of the Sensuous, which 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 talks about how our perception of of any given thing is actually um, synesthesia, because our knowledge or, or or sense or or concept of of meadow sweet is all of those things mixed together, isn't it? Mm. And and I've never thought about that before. That actually, what we know as meadow sweet, or what we know as another person, you know, if we've been physically present, you you remember that at least unconsciously you remember the the faint smell of that person. Mm. And and so when most pretty much everything that we think of. Our sense of that is a mixture of sights, sounds, textures. So all I'm trying to say is, when you say a picture of nature, it's um, it's it's just the the poverty of language, I guess. Mm. It isn't just a picture, is it? That's what I'm trying to say. Yep, it's yep. it's, it's multi sensory grasping or or, or um, knowing of that thing, uh, and also human beings itself thinking and feeling you can call it also nature at least in Finnish language yeah ah well actually I'm trying to think who I was talking to um, I was talking to somebody in the last few days I'm trying to think who it was in the English dictionary the um, the word for nature actually excludes humans it specifically says something like you know the the living world uh, apart from humans, <laughs> and this person was talking about having a campaign because that's terrible. <laughs> in the English language, we we don't include humans in our actual dictionary definition of nature. Yes, it's it's same in in Finland. Uh, the official uh, uh, dictionary says that nature doesn't include human being. It's the living are. Uh, and non-living nature, but not human. But if you are looking at, uh, for example, Karelian dictionary and word about nature, it, it's giving up, uh, or it's it's more like human being itself. And if you are looking at the Sami people's dictionary and uh, meaning, uh, the word meaning of nature. It, it, it includes the spirit also, not just the human being, but the, the whole thing which is uh, inside the nature. So there are different layers of meaning of nature word in Finland. Actually, I've realized who it was I was talking to. Um, it's a, another foraging friend of mine called uh, Adele Nozadar, and uh, we'll be doing a thing, a podcast with her in a couple of weeks, actually. Um, 
But it's a, it's a big deal, isn't it? And, and actually, it makes me think what you're saying about the nature pho photographs. There's stories about the um, Yosemite National Park in, this, in, the, in, in the United States. And apparently, when, when that park was first declared um, a park, um, it had to do with the John Muir Foundation, I think, I think it was Roosevelt or something. But it was actually an inherently racist thing that happened there um, and really promoting this idea of nature apart from humans because they sent photographers there to photograph the landscape. But the photographers had to wait because there were Native American people actually working the land um, while they were trying to take these photographs. They had to wait for the Native American people to go home <laughs> so that they could then take their photographs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then their photograph was to illustrate that here is a pristine wilderness untouched by human hands. So they knew it was a lie. They knew that this landscape was actually the creation of human hands in partnership with with uh, all the other species. Yeah. So yeah, that that's a deeply rooted idea, isn't it? That the, mm -hmm. the definition of nature and and the and the idea within nature photography. Mm. Both same common route that, that it's a wrong false idea yeah i mean if you say to somebody are you are you an organism no one could say the definition of organism doesn't include humans and yet nature is just the sum total of all the um well perhaps not perhaps perhaps i don't know i'd have to think about it does the does the idea of nature go beyond the biological do you think to rocks and wind and things but anyway we certainly couldn't say we're 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 not bio biological. Thinking about that, that question that uh, is it a uh, human being part of nature? Well, I think we are part of, but uh, there's a question that uh, we can't live without nature, but can nature live without us? I don't know. <laughs> I haven't figured that yet. But uh, if we are doing things that uh, takes us deeper in nature. It gives us the tools to realize what kind or how important the nature is to us. And uh, when we are realizing that nature is important to us, we are going to do more cool things that we can keep the nature safe or we are doing less harming things to nature. Well, you know, I think, I think it's important to, to certainly uh, kind of back down from our position of, you know, arrogant, swaggering dominance over everything that obviously has a thought right in the middle of it. That swaggering dominance has the thought in the middle of it that we're more important, you know, more important. But I personally don't go to the lengths of saying that, that therefore, um, I don't want to take that. Um, I mean, someone's emailed this week describing that as a, as a exceptionalist position, which I've never come across that before, but the exceptionalist view of humans says that we are more important. And I definitely don't. I don't uh, hold to that, that we're more important than everything else. But at the same time, I think we have the potential. Well, we don't just have the potential. We are more influential than everything else. Mm. That's just a fact. And, mm. and, and I think if we don't grapple with that fact, I think then we're stumbling in the dark because the fact is our presence is extremely impactful compared with every other species. The only difference is, unlike every other species, uh, and maybe this is an exceptionalist point of view in a sense, that we are exceptional in that we can stand back and reflect on and then change the exact nature of that influence. I think that's an important thing to realize because 
I mean, for example, the um, well, the example I keep coming back to really is is the the state of affairs in Australia prior to white interference, following you know seventeen eighty eight when when the English turned up. I personally believe that continent was um, absolutely the whole continent was flourishing and thriving because of the presence of human beings there. And it certainly was a very different continent to what it would have been had there not been human beings. I mean, dramatic. Mm. The, uh, you know, and certainly there's, there's indigenous people who have said that they believe the, the, the biomass and biodiversity, they hold it as a point of great pride, the biomass of, of edible stuff and biodiversity of species was um, much greater because of because of that and because people were actively um, working with the wild ecosystems there without ever crossing the line into into farming so to me that's the greatest example you know that, that the land flourished because people were there and also I think there's ecological systems in nature that we are not realized yet or we don't know yet Uh, what effects what and that's why I'm I'm wondering or thinking about that uh, does the nature needs human beings we don't know that we have been here quite a long time uh, from us it shows that we are doing quite a lot of harm nowadays to the nature we if we don't change the our way to do things but uh, I think it's a part of human beings thinking that it's it's not so open wide uh, thinking that this ecosystem what we have here we don't know it so well. I think there is quite a lot of different kind of things that affects its others that we are not realized yet. Well, I think if you if you look at the The two areas of microbiology which have just really become very um, sort of hot topics in the last couple of years, um, and that they've been hot research topics for the last sort of 10, 20 years. You look at the microbiology of the soil and the microbiology of the human gut, and the You know the extraordinary and the sort of mycorrhizal networks in forests. It, you know the extraordinary insights that's that's yielding up, so that we now realize that when we cut a forest down, what what we actually what what we actually did, mm. that it's this kind of multi-species genocide that that that's happened. We have destroyed whole communities, mm. whole, whole ecological civilizations, you could say, and also that we now understand ourselves to be whole ecological civilizations, each one of us, mm. because of the, the, the microbiome. So I think I, I definitely agree. You know, we, we, we've just begun to scratch the surface of that mm. microbial world, and we're only just beginning to see the implications of it, how profound they might be. It's almost like, Anna, we, we all need to stand still mm. for ages, just in case we break something. Because we realize all of a sudden, every time we move, we're, we're, we're breaking something because we, mm. we, we can't see it and we don't know what we're doing. Yeah, I just, I just wonder what we, what, we could, what we could be in our relation to our surroundings if we could see what we don't see now. Mm. How people living on Earth could, mm, mm. could be a very different entity, almost like a different species, you know, if we change... Mm. We changed our ecological relations on the basis of, of deeper insight, you know, or wisdom. Um, we would almost be a different species. And uh, as far as the biosphere is experienced in us, because most of our points of contact at the moment are causing a violation to one or other part of the uh, the linkages that make up the ecology of the planet, um, which is obviously not good at all. But I keep coming back to how profoundly uh, reciprocal the relation between people and land used to be in, in hunter-gatherer societies. 
Mm. And I think, what if the insights that we could have now through microbiology and every other kind of, you know, you know, perhaps through even computer modeling. I mean, I'm not a huge fan of technology at all because of, I think there's sort of rampant use of technology is causing all sorts of breakdown of linkages, but the, 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 the possibility of using computer modeling to try and gain insights into the complexity of the biosphere is possibly something that might be helpful, not to try and replace biological systems with, with artificial intelligence or anything, but just mm. could see a bit more what's going on. There's just like tools to see. And, and if we applied the kind of wisdom that, that science and technology could be yielding up, if it was used more thoughtfully, then yeah, I think that could, that could inform a very different way of being for us. But nevertheless, anyway, I think it would be a way of being that would start with what you and I know all too well, and that's that unless people are touching the soil, mm. it, nothing is going to work. You know? And talk, I mean, talking of touching the soil, what, what, are the, um, what are the students working on that you have now? Because, of course, you, 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 you're still doing what you were doing before. I, uh, it's very bespoke, yeah? Like if your teaching is somewhat based around what people come to you and want to do in terms of a possible business using wild plants. Mm, mm. Is, is there anything new going on? Since we have uh, spoken together, I think um, nowadays we have about 25 students doing the basic studies here. And last spring we started the, the next level education here in Kemijärvi. Uh, it's, uh, we have four students there and they are serious about doing business with these nature products. And that's new here also. But um, uh, we have more students, but um, I was lucky to be part of group that uh, was thinking about the uh, this, our education's we are going to change a little bit in whole Finland our basic education and I was part of that group and I was lucky enough to be there to thinking about that what should we change a little bit there and what way we are going to develop it in the future. I like it a lot because we are moving a little bit uh, holistic thinking about nature we also have the species. We have to learn different plants and mushrooms and berries. Also, we have to know how to make products, but back background of those things, there are the holistic things of ecology of nature. And I think it's it's very good part, which is going to change a little bit compared to days. So you're, you're, you're talking about what people are going to be teaching kids in schools? Is, is... Uh, here in vocational school. Mm. Okay. Yeah. But, but this broader discussion you were talking about having, that, that related to adult education rather than... Yes, um... yes, yes. Yeah. And also uh, uh, one change is that uh, nowadays we, we can have young people or adults at the same group. We don't separate them anymore. But our school here, uh, adult people come mostly yeah. to study the nature. But there's a chance also that a student can be age of uh, 17 or 18 or 16. And and what sort of what sort of businesses are your... Um, are your students focusing on then that they're, they're, they're looking to? Mostly they are doing edible things. Yeah. Uh, and uh, few people, they are concentrating uh, cosmetics. Okay. I think those are the main things they are. They are studying and they are doing business with it. Yeah. I always just think it's so amazing that 
that your school exists, you know, as a, as a state-funded um, mm. thing of education. Because, you know, obviously, that it means that your government recognises the importance of this sector, using wild foods and, um, and you know, for, for us in England, rural, rural development means uh, having more bed and breakfasts. <laughs> Basically, that's what it means. Or I don't know, farmers diversifying their crops. It, it it certainly doesn't mean the government getting behind the development of small businesses that are utilising um, wild resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. Whereas your your government obviously has a vision. I mean, I think I'm not sure if it was you that explained it to me, but some somebody explained it that that the um, the idea is to actually keep people in the rural region so everybody doesn't move to the city. And I just think that's incredible. Nowhere else in the world is a, is a government trying to do that. It seems to me that the whole trajectory of modern life is is to just suck everybody into the city. Yeah, yeah. Alone, yeah. And uh, that was one thing when we started to to this ed education in this area is that uh, that knowledge that people who are living at this area they don't want to move anywhere else than they want to stay where they live they want to make some living in this area and uh, that's why we developed this education a little bit different than normal vocational school because we don't um, we have that kind of system that uh, few days of months like four or six days of months students are coming here at the school but uh, the rest of time either teacher is going to visit the students or they do have uh, some exercise in yeah. network or in nature that's very good. I mean, that's Wait. unique. That must be unique. Mm. Because uh, if the people are living, for example, uh, Savukoski, there's a totally different nature than, for example, Rovaniemi. Yeah. And if you are going to do your business in Savukoski, you definitely have to know what kind of nature, where you can pick up the yarrows or something else what are the connections in that area from uh, to the other companies or business so why come to Rovaniemi uh, Kemijärvi where our school is but teacher is going to the Savukoski and they are doing there the teaching it's so radical uh, I mean I, I just I've been doing a lot of thinking about the difference between uh, mechanisms and and organisms that's been one of the kind of thoughts I've been e exploring and the main point is that mechanisms decontextualize everything whereas organisms by definition they're in they're in a context and the important thing is the relation between between and within you know so the organism and its mm -hmm. surroundings and the relations within the organism so you know your your approach there, according to that train of thought, is is an organism approach, or a genuinely organic approach, because you're you're looking at the actual position of that person in relation to their um, local ecology. But it's it's really interesting that you're not just talking about the the plant and animal ecology; you're talking about the business ecology. Mm -hmm. Who else do they have nearby them? I think there's this is fascinating. Yeah. But rather than teaching a one size fits all thing about business, abstract business principles or whatever, it's amazing. Well, it means that um, if you're a teacher, you have to have quite a huge network of other companies or businesses. Uh, when we started, it was quite easy because uh, the most of our students came from this Eastern. Lapland area 
but not nowadays we have students from Helsinki or southern part of Finland, and then you have to have quite a lot uh, wider uh, contacts, other companies, other businesses. You have to be aware of that, uh, what kind of business is going around, for example, Tampere or Oulu. But it's doing that's doing something for you then, because your your view and knowledge of Finland in terms of the existence of these businesses and people working with land and wild products. That means that your your thing is growing and and developing. That's mm, uh, also, but uh, your nature camera in your head. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. But also, there are lots of other people in my picture. In yeah. my head, yeah, 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 yeah. You you can always ask somebody that. Do you know this kind of? I have a student that she or she needs this kind of thing. Do you know any anybody who yeah. I could ask? Yeah. Is there any kind of network that's that's in any way um, other than informal? I mean, is there any kind of association between or link? You know, a trade association or or. A, a mutual support organization between all the nature product people in Finland. Is there anything like that going on? Uh, actually, we have two different kind of organizations, mm. and uh, they both are very good. Good one that you can always call there and ask if you have some some kind of problem, and they they can give you advice that okay, you can call there, and this is quite interesting uh, company. You can contact them also. Uh, actually, we had last week the whole Finland's uh, event here in, uh, not here, but Kajani, that all the people who are involved these, uh, for example, native products, they were gathering there. And uh, there was a good program, but also it's very good way to connect people you can see the people who are working with teachers, entrepreneurs. Everybody was there, almost everybody. Amazing. And there was there were like talks and workshops. Yep. And... Yep. Talks and uh, uh, seminar. People were bringing up uh, new researches results and uh, different cases and one day we were visiting different kind of companies at that area okay and did any of the talks or presentations really stand out to you as particularly interesting or useful or? Mm, they are very useful we have uh, first day it was uh, so-called researchers day they they bring out different kind of results of researches. And the second day is um, more common. Uh, there are different um, subjects of very in interesting things about which is going around nowadays in our, our sector. And the third day was the visiting day of businesses. For, for example, one one interesting thing was uh, how is the organic things arranged in Finland nowadays, forest organic things. Yeah. Mm, what else there was? Um, uh, quite a lot of uh, different kind of projects, which has had quite good results also, or more like uh, sharing the good ways to do something. I mean, I know from... From from visits and conversations, you know, visits to Finland and conversations with you in the past, that the, the research sector is is amazing in uh, Finland around these things. Can can you? Um, I remember you telling me about some research about bilberries, uh, and wasn't there something about the the leaf being discovered to be uh, beneficial in a medicinal way? And then somebody researched what happened if um, if you take the leaf off, and does mm, that mm. Was, what was mm. that? Subject? Yeah, um, uh, Bilberry's leaf 
or the new new growth of the bilberry, not just the leaf. Um, researchers found out that uh, it's a good good me medicine if you have um, some problems of insulin. Okay. And uh, they found out that, and uh, some researchers uh, develop different kind of mechanism to take off the or harvest or cut the bilberry at the topic of the bilberry. And uh, some researchers find out that what kind of forest is the best place to uh, harvest them or forage them. And then they realize they okay, they have to research that uh, what kind of effects it might be if you are cutting off the topics of the pilberry. And so the whole package was uh, quite good to people who co were concentrating to make some products of uh, pilberry leaves or the topic of the pilberry. And uh, it, it was uh, it was a um, good way to make some business with it because you have all the results of researchers. Because presumably they found that it wasn't damaging to the plants. They, no. But... Yeah, it was. Uh, you can safely uh, cut them off, but uh, um, they say that it's a good way to hold it up one or two years, and after that you can go it there again, not year after year. You harvest, yeah, well, what, so you just you'd move around different sites and, um, mm. yeah. And, and has that resulted in, is, is that a growing um, product? Have people, have people followed that up yet, or is it yet to develop um, in terms of people actually making products from that? Um, I think that uh, now it's the problem of how to make it in tea, what, which way it's useful to do it, tea. Okay, yeah. Um, I mean, on a related subject, I know that, I know that when you, you came over, you, you showed us some teas, um, for example, with the uh, cloudberry leaf. Mm. I've since then, well, something's something's happened in the in the UK, which is that lots of people have started making tea, and I think it's a traditional method. I haven't done it yet myself, but I am drinking this tea that a friend of mine made using this what I think is a traditional method. So it's rose rose bay willow herb, mm. and it's you know it's used in the fermentation. But also, you you've got to roll the leaves with your fingers, so it's quite quite labour intensive. But a friend of mine made some of this and brought some down when he visited. I have to say, it's the nicest tea. It's so tasty. You have a lot of rose bay willow herb, don't you? In yeah. <laughs> I can imagine. I mean, maybe I should send you some of this tea because um, it's a product that could be huge. I think, and and of course, it's got the added thing that it's. Um, it's supposed to be pre preventative and curative of uh, prostate cancer. Mm. And yet it's really tasty. So, yeah, I, I mean, I heard about the prostate cancer thing about 18 years ago, I think. And I always thought, I wonder how you could uh, get that in a form where you could drink it every or, or eat it or drink it every day. And, um, and it turns out that there is the tradition of, of, of making a tea out of it, which is that that seems to be the the answer to that question. You drink a tea of it every day. But you, yeah, you you guys have done quite a lot with um, in Finland. There's a lot of work been done around uh, making teas. I guess. I think it's the main well basic thing. Yeah. What we have to learn or we are doing. And you use you use the um, for some of them you're using a kind of oxidation or fermentation. When when you were here, you showed us um, that you'd seal them up in a bag and put them in a, a dehydrator or something overnight. Is that right? Yeah, and nowadays we are doing a little bit different. We are, for example, the cloudberry leaves we are putting at the freezer. Ah. At first, it, ah. it's it's doing the cracking of the cells in the freezer. You don't need to mm, do it 
me- mechanical anymore. Yeah. After picking, we are packing them in plastic bag and putting in freezer. And later, when we have time, it means winter, and uh, we are taking them off and put the oven about six or eight hours. And what temperature in the oven? Mm, low as possible. Just very, very low, yeah. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And uh, after, uh, during that time, it's, it's fermented, it's, it's mm. turning out brown. Mm. And uh, after that time, we can take them off and put it into dryer. And where did the idea of putting it in the freezer come from? Um, it comes that, um, well, if you are doing it mechanical way, the main thing is that you have to crush the cells so you can, it's it's starting the process. But if you are putting it in the freezer, yeah. the freezer, the coldness, when it's freezing, it's it's cracking the cells there. Do you think, when my friend um, is is rolling the the rose bay willow herb, is that is that putting it in the freezer? Is it going to do the same job? Yes. As, it, as him crushing it between his fingers. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Wow, that's all of a sudden that tea becomes a lot easier to make. <laughs> yep. It's less charming. It's quite sweet, I think, to sit there rolling it, but still. Yeah. yeah. If you have to do quite a lot, that's it's it's taking quite a long time. Not enough fingers and not enough hours. Yeah, yeah. And we also had um, before earlier when we uh, developed this system, we had we take some research that what kind of um, uh, is there uh, is it more effective way to put freezer or do it mechanical way than which one is better? Yeah. If you are checking out some ingredients from the leaves, and it turns that uh, if you are putting into the freezer instead of mechanical way to do it, it's much better. That's great. And uh, but what I was kind of fishing for was it, is, was this was this your something that came out of the school that you you just thought to do it that way, or or is this something people are doing elsewhere that you? you... Well, we are doing here in our school this way, mm. also. But uh, it's it's not the it's not the secret. <laughs> we had a huge group which were working with these leaves and fermentations, yeah. and it was open information. So if you want to use it, you can do it. But uh, we also teach students that you can do it mechanical way. But we are doing here like this because it's much more effective and faster and easier way to do it i guess i guess what i'm trying to get out of you is whether this was your innovation because no 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 but it's a great it's a fantastic step forward isn't it in terms of the the labor involved in that process it's amazing Mm, actually actually it was my i think it's my colleagues who were thinking about okay we should do it this way and check out what is going to do it Ah, so it is your innovation in terms of you collectively. No, uh, yeah. Yeah. But it was somebody's idea. Yeah. I just love it, though, that, that, that we're all just tinkering, and every once in a while somebody thinks, I wonder what would happen if you do this. Um, mm. And then instead of it being a matter of um, intellectual property rights, the only thing you're there trying to do is enable people to to do things better. That's mm, your. Mm. It's not to patent a a new insight so that someone can make more money uh, and 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 all the others not make any money. Mm, mm. And uh, we are so tiny little group here in Finland that, and especially in Lapland that uh, it's. Well, it's like the pilberry leaves, that yeah. there's a problem, we should do something about it. Mm. Or we have a problem with cloudberry leaves, we should do something. Okay, let's gather in 
together. You are doing this, you are doing that. Okay, you are doing that. And we have this kind of results. And every can, everybody can use it if, you, if they want to use it. It's amazing. There was another issue around the Cloudbury, though. We, I wondered how that's getting on. So last time we spoke, in fact, I think when you visited, the, the lady that came with you was, was working on this problem. There was, there was the issue about the European Union uh, novel foods legislation. And at that point, there was some problem around the Cloudbury tea because unless you could prove that there was a traditional use of the leaf of the Cloudberry as for, for human consumption, you then had to spend millions proving that it wasn't harmful. Mm -hmm. So how is that situation now? Is, 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 that, is that still a problem or, or you managed to find a way through that? I have to check it nowadays situation. Is it, is it allowed to use as a tea? Yeah, I have to check it out how it's like because I think that then that time we were talking about that that it was there was an interest to do some juice of it not just the tea and yeah. that time it was not allowed to do it as a juice or anything edible product but uh, I think I have to check it check it a little bit later I think it's not open it's not allowed to use it. We couldn't find any documents of it that it's been used before 1997. I wonder, is it, is it one of these things, though, that somebody in an ivory tower of a bureaucracy is saying, oh, no, no, you can't do that? And on the other hand, if you did do it, is somebody actually going to prosecute you? I mean, that, 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 that would be my question. Mm, you can do it, but uh, you can put it in the market or you can sell it. But uh, if they are finding out that there's an ingredients not allowed to use by the novel, you have to take it back, the products. Has that, has that actually happened in Finland? Uh, uh, yeah, I think it has happened. Because... There's a parallel situation here. I know I was talking to Simon Ranger, who, who does a, a company. He has a company called Sea Greens, and they do some of the, um, the rack species, the fucus species of seaweed. And he, he was talking to somebody who was, uh, he was being told that he would need to come up with novel foods. Um, you know, he'd have to engage with this novel foods regulations thing. I'm not sure where that particular... Um, scenario ended up. I, I, I haven't talked to Simon about it for a while. But the crazy thing in both cases is that, uh, you know, that rubus genus, which the cloudberry belongs to, and obviously raspberries and blackberries, there's such a widespread case to be made for, for the non toxicity of that genus. It, it, the idea that, and, and the same goes for the fucus genus. The idea, it's a very, very blunt instrument uh, I, to, to bring this novel foods thing to bear and say, you know, if you can't prove traditional use, then you have to spend millions analyzing every pound and, 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 and I don't know if they want animal experiments or what they want to prove that it's not dangerous. But uh, I suppose I'd take um, solace from the fact that... Um, that legislation doesn't seem to have, have been enforced anywhere in the UK um, with, with any of the wild products. But perhaps I'm making a mistake to mention it on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> you can edit it this way. <laughs> Actually, um, I take the cloudberry leaves. It's allowed to use as a tea, but nothing else. Okay. And uh, I have another... <laughs> Uh, example of um, what kind of funny things coming up from Noel. We have talked about quite a lot, very traditional plant of Lapland called uh, um, Marian Tuoksuheina in Finnish and the Latin name of Hierokloe Hirta or 
Hierokloe odorata. And um, though it's traditional plant, it has been used quite a long time. We didn't get it out of that novel list. It's not allowed to use as uh, edible products, which is very strange things. Uh, people have done quite a lot and hard work to find out all the documents before 1997. And nowadays, the situation is like that, that they are wondering that which one, Hierokloe odorata or Hierokloe hirta, is growing here because you have to have microscope that you can see the difference between these two plants. And if you, we have thought that it has been Hierokloe odorata or Hirta. Now I, I mixed up them, but uh, the main thing is that one of those is allowed to use as a edible products. Yeah. But now they are discussing about that, which one is growing here in Lapland. It's quite funny way to, because it's very tasteful and it's very tra traditional plant and many people wants to use it as a product, but nowadays they, are, they, know, they don't know what to do with it because uh, they don't know which one, Hierokloe Hirta or Odorata, is it? Well, that, that sounds like something that might be resolved to enable people to use it. Do you think that ought to be possible to settle that question as to which one it is? I have to check it. Hierokloe Odorata is the one you can find uh, uh, documents before 1997, and we have... Uh, use it, or we thought that it's Hierokloe Hirta, which grows here in Lapland. And uh, if we can prove it's Hierokloe Odorata, it's allowed to use okay. as edible products. Okay. So how do you how do you go about proving that then? It says that um, uh, there's a documents from Belgium, and if you found documents around Europe, that might might be enough. To prove that it's it's used before 1997, and it also says that it's 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 allowed Belgium, France, and Italy also. Right, right. But how do you prove to them which one it is you've got? <laughs> oh, that's a big question because uh, you need a microscope to separate them. So you have to. But there must be some sort of authority that 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 will. Say yes, you've got the right one. Mm, but I think our research re the researcher is doing that work nowadays. Yeah, trying to find out because there are many companies which which are waiting for that knowledge uh, information. Oh, I see. So they're all sitting there waiting. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are you up to today? I know have you got have you got students today, or it's a quiet day. We have students in the skit in the skit uh, kitchen <laughs> right now, and we I have my colleague working there. But I'm going to meet one student, and we are talking about her future. Uh, what kind of studies he is going? Uh, her is going to do it next year. And also we have quite busy time here because um, we are getting ready for our Christmas market and uh, they are doing their, um, well, they are showing their knowledge of uh, nature products during that Christmas market. So there'll be lots of products on display that everyone's been working on all year. Yep. Yeah, lovely. Well, I've got to get out and try and find um, half a kilogram of chickweed. Cause, uh, oh, how was your year about mushrooms? Mushrooms? Yeah. It, we, oh, well, we had, um, we had uh, a very good year for porcini. And um, just now I've had 
quite a lot of the, um, I think it's Amanita rubensis, the blusher. Mm -hmm. A big harvest of that. And the thing for both, and just for anyone listening, you can only eat that if it's cooked. It's poisonous when it's raw. But for both of those, the, the mushroom fly has been uh, having a very, very bad year, which is good for us. So hardly any maggots, in, hardly any worms in the mushrooms. It's been amazing. Especially for that Amanita rubensis is normally, even the tiny ones are full of worms, but um, I've picked many, many with, with no worms at all. So that was good. I have uh, one very small amount left of, of the Masutake. Do you remember you put me in touch with someone mm. that had a huge harvest of Masutake when you had your amazing year? Mm. Um, I think you said that was the best year for Masutake you'd ever had, wasn't it? Yep. Uh, in all the years, and and so we we I think we bought twenty kilos of dried masutake in the end from that chap. But now I have one small jar with with about ten pieces in. Oh. <laughs> I don't really want to let it go, but um, yeah, it's almost like a museum piece now. <laughs> masutake from Lapland, from the best masutake year ever. Yeah. <laughs> We had a horrible year. We for, didn't get oh, anything. Well, for all species, it was a bad yep. year. For, oh, no. no. Yep. Too dry? Yep. Yep. I don't know. It was quite funny because um, Porcini, we had the first crop around June, July. And uh, in my area, this eastern Lapland, there was nothing. But instead of 100 kilometers... To the west, there was a huge amount of porcinis, ah. uh, like 40 kilos at once. And uh, the autumn crop was also awful. One, one tiny mushrooms, nothing at all. It was horrible, not just for the human beings, but also the reindeers was horrified because it's, it's very important food to the reindeers. That's really interesting, yeah. Also, we had quite quite bad year about mush, uh, berries also. Uh, yeah. Couldn't find cloud berries, couldn't find peel berries. I found quite fast lingam berries, but cranberries also was, was vanished. We didn't get them at all. I mean, for our, for our berries, which are mostly things on on uh, small trees or bushes it's generally that we had a storm when things are in flower but that causes a bad year all the all the flowers get messed up and then then the plant doesn't produce fruit but, but yeah do you, do you have any idea what causes a, a bad berry year for these because these are all plants very close to the ground aren't they so. mm, and uh, all these needs flies or bugs to do in the yeah. fermentation but uh, you mean yeah yeah very so, very very bad year do you think it's a lack of insects possibly that's uh i think it's uh, one part of that but also it doesn't need that one bad weather with heavy rain right. and it will cause quite a damage to yeah. the crop yeah, I'll say same same thing. Same thing as for us for the bushes. Mm. All right. Well, I'm sorry to hear that. Double whammy. Bad bad year for berries and bad year for mushrooms. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Next year should be a little bit better. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to venture out and try and find my chickweed. We've 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 had a um amazing few weeks for chickweed and lots of other salads because I've got uh, there's a field next to my house that. Uh, as Lane, after being after the the wild oat, no, the uh, the organic oat crop was cut. The farmers just left it um, for all the plants to come up because he then puts cattle on there to to eat the eat mm -hmm. the, the, the the plants. So in the meantime, we've had a spectacular time of salads and greens off this field, just just next to the house. So we go out and just fill a fill a colander up with with plants that we're either going to cook down as a mixed greens or as a mixed wild salad. And then um, a week and a half ago, 
the farmer put the cows on there. And they've eaten all my greens and salads. <laughs> and we were also harvesting from there for the restaurants. So much chickweed. You could just pick kilos and kilos. And uh, to begin with, the cows didn't eat the chickweed. They, they went for the other plants first. So we were still able to pick. But when they'd eaten everything else, they then ate the chickweed. So now we have no chickweed. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to venture forth further afield. I've got to go further away to see if I can find some. So, yeah, I mean, um, you were saying that the reindeer in your area have gone far south at the moment because they can't feed. Um, they are wandering uh, to the south part of Lapland because... Um, we have had winter. Winter came so early and uh, it shows that there are ice between the ground and snow and it's very difficult to reindeer to dig the food out of there. And that's why they are wandering a little bit easier places, which means going a little bit southern. But also there are, I think one reason might be that we had so bad year of mushrooms, and mushrooms are very important food for the reindeers. Mm. And when you say they can't feed under the snow, what would they what would they normally be feeding on underneath the snow? Is it lichens, or are there plants that still survive under the snow? Or um, lichen is the main food for them, but I think they are taking up some plants also. Yeah, but lichen is the main food for them, and the researchers say that you can see um, the amount of reindeers here in Lapland uh, if you are taking picture of the forest which grows the lichen. Uh, we have so many reindeers here that the lichen, amount of lichens have, um, there are not so much lichen anymore. And if you have, um, for example, near of my summer cottage, there's a place, there are pens around the area. And inside the pens, there are huge amounts of lichen because the reindeers are they can't go inside the fence. Yeah. And the lichen can grow there. And there are there has been quite a lot discussion about that should we drop the rain uh, the amount of reindeers in Lapland. Do we have too much reindeers here? Yeah. And and is it is it that there are more reindeer now than there were in the past then? I'm not sure, but uh, uh, they have limited the amount of reindeers. Um, they are um, estimated every year how much the nature can hold up the reindeers. And uh, reindeer herders should uh, drop the amount of reindeers if the researchers say that there are too many reindeers. So you can't grow your uh, amount of reindeers year after year. There, it's, it's very... Um, there are restrictions. Right? Yes, yeah, yeah. But I'm fascinated about the reindeer diet. So they eat a large number of plants, right? A lot of different species. Yeah, they are eating over 300 different yeah. kinds of plants. Yeah. And uh, that not includes the amount of mushrooms. Mushrooms are also very important food to the reindeers. So th that, that, um, what makes, what that makes me think about is, you know, the discussions we've been having with this, um, this guy that's spent years studying grazing animals, Fred Provenza, and he he talks about the wisdom of the well he talks about the wisdom of the body, whether it's our body or the body of a of a grazing animal or whatever, that the body tells you what you need to eat. 
if you know how to listen to it. And he talks about how the animals follow that wisdom. And as a result, they can self-medicate with plants or, or whatever kind of food. It could be mushrooms. Um, mm. And also they can very precisely engage with specific plants to meet specific nutritional needs. Mm. That's, that's, that's kind of mind-blowing to think that if you have a, 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 a selection of you know, over 300 plants and who knows how many species of mushroom and how many species of lichen, but those reindeer are able to very, very, if, if they're following the wisdom of their body, which they surely are, they have a very, very precise um, way of, of meeting very, very precisely their own nutritional and medicinal mm -hmm. needs. They also have to know the places where they are growing. Yeah. Because reindeer is going around the certain, certain area, certain, well, they have autumn or winter or spring or summertime. They have different kind of places. And I think it's the sense of um, nature that what kind of places those plants are growing. Yeah. They're going after that food. Yeah. So they go there to get that food, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean it's very sophisticated. Um, and and also they're eating they're eating a large number of the mushrooms. So um, that's 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 an important point, isn't it? Um, with regard to uh, people who are worried about people picking too many mushrooms. Mm -hmm. So reindeers have eaten mushrooms much longer than human beings here. And uh, they haven't vanished. The mushrooms haven't vanished at all from our nature. And nowadays yeah, we are worried about that human beings are picking up the, all the <laughs> mushrooms. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if it was going to be a problem, then they would have disappeared. A long mm. time ago from, from right there, yeah. So, I mean, we, we have this thing that happens in some of our woodlands in, in, in England where you do see mushrooms just rotting into the ground because nothing has eaten it. But I suspect that that didn't used to be the case. I think it's because we have fewer wild animals now in England. Mm. Mm. Like no wild boar, for example, and... um. Well, we do have quite a lot of deer, but still, I, I suspect that in the past there would have been fewer mushrooms that ended up uh, going rotten because they'd have been eaten. Here, here in Lapland, you have to be very quick one <laughs> because uh, mushrooms. Because, for example, our area there are twelve thousand of reindeers and under two thousand human beings, and I think almost every reindeer are foraging mushrooms but small part of human beings are foraging mushrooms the early human gets the mushroom yeah well we have this phrase in england the early bird gets the worm you know so uh, yeah. the other thing i wanted to um talk about is whether the reindeer who are who are you know because people are herding those reindeer so what um what are the benefits to the reindeer you know how are the how are the herders, you know, assisting the reindeer um, so that they have um, an easier time or a better time than than um, than if they were completely wild? In our area, we, the benefits to the reindeers are that um, um, during the winter time, um, reindeer herders are separating females and males and mm. they are taking the females uh, we call it home there are big fences near reindeer herders home where they are feeding the females and why females because females are carrying the calves mm. and uh, calves means that uh, next year you can sell reindeers and selling reindeers for meat for food, it means living for the reindeer herders. That's why they are taking care of the females. 
Are they like indoors eating uh, hay or what? Did you do you know do you know anything about that? Hay and lichen. Ah. Hmm. Ah, so the herders are harvesting lichen to feed the, the reindeer. Yes, uh, they are foraging it or harvesting a little bit uh, southern, southern from Lapland because there are very good uh, fields of lichen. Amazing. And the hay, is that is that brought in from the south as well or is it? No, it's, um, well, we call it... Uh, Reindeer hay, yeah. it's different than the normal hay for, for example, agriculture for yeah. the cows. Um, the reindeer hair must be quite uh, natural hay. Yeah. Very yeah, soft. Yeah, yeah. The reason I ask is, is another, another piece to the jigsaw um, with, uh, with Fred's work is, is seeing that the... Um, the culture of food is passed on through the mother to the to the um, the infant animal from the womb, and then through um, through the milk. So, if the mother's diet is is wild, then the the uh, the baby animal is being introduced to the to the wild foods of that landscape, even in the womb. And even when, when feeding on milk. So that's why I was asking about the the, uh, the diet. Yeah. Oh, okay. And uh, mm, as I told you a little bit earlier, that uh, we are not milking the reindeers because it's so hard to milk them. You have to teach the reindeers to stay there. And yeah. if you manage to have milk, it's like one deciliter amount of milk yeah and i knew that uh, one one place in other another part of lapland they have milked the reindeers but they have used it as a cosmetics not just edible presumably because they could sell it at a higher price i imagine yeah yeah, yeah. well it's a whole other world with these reindeer it's fascinating mm, yeah So thanks for listening to the podcast. Um, as ever, if you go to the forager.org.uk forward slash podcast uh, webpage, you can see all of the links relating to this week's conversation. And uh, once again, I'd just like to say we'd, I'd, I'd love to hear from you, especially if you're in um, places other than the ones I mentioned earlier, Europe and, the, and uh, North America. We'd just love to hear. For, we, see, we see we have few people in places like Japan and Sri Lanka. We just... We'd just love to hear from you and let us know where, where you are and, and uh, what your interest in the podcast is. Uh, because, you know, in the long run, what I'm really trying to do with the podcast is is to link people together, you know, to join up people who are thinking and working around wild plants um, or who would like to and provide resources and contacts around the world um, for, for people to do that. Um, so, yeah, all the more reason why really we'd love to hear from you.